Okay, bit of a different video uh, this week. We're going to be looking at this clock generator. I've had a number of requests to do this. And of course, this is based around the SI5351 uh, clock generator I see from Silicon Labs. Now, this is a breakout board. These are quite common. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to go through how this thing works, how to connect it up to an Arduino. Of course, we're using the Arduino to control it. And then ultimately, um, yeah, we'll have a look at the test equipment, see how this thing's performing, and then we'll put it into this radio, or to attempt to control the radio. And this is an old 1980s 11 metre transceiver. It's multi-mode. Um, so I thought this might be a good candidate for testing. And then we, of course, we can do some performance testing on this and see if this is better or worse for having this clock generator in there. Okay, so this is the uh, breakout board that I've purchased. I've got it from Amazon. Uh, it's quite reasonably priced uh, delivered. That's to here in the UK. But I looked over here, you can actually get them from AliExpress for a fraction of the price, £1.36. In fact, the shipping is more than the cost of the board. Now, if there's any difference, I don't know. Um, these are all clones. Uh, the original breakout board, I think the concept was actually designed by um, Adafruit. Now, Adafruit um, are quite well established. And they do loads of little gadgets and bits and add-ons and breakout boards and all kinds of carry-on. Great stuff for uh, Arduinos and um, Raspberry Pis and all that good stuff. So, yeah, I'd say the build quality on this is a little better. Okay, so if we take a look at this, we've got three clock outputs, 0, 1 and 2. Uh, so, yeah, we can actually produce three separate uh, clock frequencies. And at the bottom here, we've got these connections here. I guess we can just put a header on. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those later. So let's look at the data sheet. Okay, so if you're new to the channel and you like this content, uh, please consider subscribing or, you know, hitting the like button as it really helps the channel. We're trying to grow the channel. So, uh, you know, thank you in advance for your support. Okay, so this is the data sheet, and um, as you can see, there's a few variants on this device. Now, the one we've got is the most basic. It's a three output uh, device, and we've got a frequency range between eight kilohertz and 160 megahertz. Uh, supply voltage is 2.5 or 3.3 volts, and it's I2C user definable configuration. So what this means is I2C is simply a, a serial communication uh, protocol uh, bus, and it just means that we can actually send some information to the IC to tell it what frequency we want it to produce. So there's a little bit more, but we'll cover that in a second. Okay, so this is the block diagram of the device we're using. And if you can look down here, you can see there's quite a few variants of this with various outputs and it's all to do with different controls i think one of them's actually got a vco yeah which we can talk about that later i think because that will come in very useful but uh, let's get back to where we are okay so you know this this is this is it so let's just have a run through what these pins are on the uh, device so we've got xa xb well that's simply where we connect a crystal We've got a choice of a 25 or 27 meg crystal and inside here we've got a bit of uh, circuitry and uh, which in turn will create our base reference uh, frequency or clock frequency to run the device itself and down here we've got sda scl now that's to do with i2c this is the i2c uh, system it's a two-wire system uh, and ground and what it means is it allows uh, you know, components, ICs, uh, to communicate via uh, a common bus. So you can actually address these, so they give them a, a, an address, a hexadecimal address, to, you know, to make it unique on the bus. But that's it, and it just means we can actually communicate. So this IC 
we will be controlling using the Arduino because the Arduino has got ITC functionality. We can write some code in there and we can tell this IC what to do via this I2C bus. All good stuff. Uh, and if we look over this side, we've got three outputs. So these are our three clock outputs that we can program. We can we can tell the IC what we want it to do. So yeah, whatever frequency or whatever amplitude we want on each of these clock outputs. Now there is some limitation, which I'll go through in a second, but that is basically it. Now obviously we've got the pins here, VDD, that is our supply voltage, and GND is ground. I don't need to explain that, or at least I hope I don't. Um, and we've got VDDO. Now what this is, uh, it's, it's a, you know, what we do with supply voltage at this point and what it does, it supplies voltage to these amplifiers, which are potentially voltage controlled amplifiers. So theoretically, if you adjust the voltage at this point, you'll be adjusting the amplitude of the waveforms coming out of the device. Okay, so let's run through how this thing works quickly. Um, now we know we're using an Arduino, uh, with an I2C bus and we're going to be sending information up here telling this IC you know ultimately what frequency we want it to produce on what output and we've got a choice of you know we can change the amplitude at these points as well so how does it do it well what we've got is we've got a PLL now what this does is up convert our frequency. So it will up convert the frequency to a, a set level, which will be, again, this is defined by the ITC bus. So typically the frequency it will produce will be between 500 and 900 um, megahertz. And I think they it's basically referred to as an intermediate clock frequency. And what that does is move across to this section, which just simply routes, um, you know, which PLL to which multi-synth. And then obviously we've got the multi-synth. And what's this do? Well, this does uh, division. So there's two layers of division. So it will divide the frequency down. So if we get a combination of an up conversion amount and two stages of frequency division. So theoretically, we can produce any frequency between eight kilohertz and 160 megahertz. That's how this thing works. And you've got two PLLs and we've got three outputs. So theoretically, we could run two outputs uh, at any frequency. However, if you wanted to run a third, you're going to be limited because you're gonna to have to share a PLL uh, you know, frequency. That's basically it. So this all comes via the I2C. So you think, well, it's all a bit complicated. It's gonna be some serious working out how to get a frequency by you know, multiplying it and then dividing it and then dividing it. Well, you don't have to because we use libraries and people have written code to do the heavy lifting. So all we do is just tell in the program and tell the library that we want a set frequency at a given output at a set amplitude and it will send the information up here and in bingo jingo there is our waveform and that's how it works so yeah it's you know it's don't get lost in the uh don't get lost in the complexity of it. It's actually, for us to control it, it's actually quite straightforward. Um, and that's it. Yeah, that's basically it. So what I want to do is get this, um, you know, breakout board connected up. Uh, we'll go through, um, have a look, get some code into the Arduino and um, see if we can get it to produce a waveform. Okay, so as you can see, we've got this thing connected up. I'll run through it quickly. 
Obviously, this is an Arduino Mega. Well, it's actually a clone. Um, obviously, we connect into the computer via the USB here. And these interconnection cables, we've got a lot of cables, they're just wires. So we connect it here, ground, and five volts on those pins, black and orange, and they go to the V in, the five volts, and the GND. Obviously the black cable goes to ground. And these two here is our I2C. So if we look on the board, we've got SDA and SCL. And they come over and connect to SDA and SCL on the clock generator. And that's it. I mean, there's not a lot more to it. It's quite straightforward. Okay, so this is the Arduino IDE. Uh, this is where you can write all the programs to actually control the Arduino. And I'm going to go over this really briefly. I'm not going to go into any detail. But um, yeah, this is it, this IDE uses, uh, you know, in order to program, we need to program in C++. Um, this is really, really bare bones in order to be able to control the um, you know the clock generator so basically what I've included two libraries the SI 5351.h and I've got uh, wire.h which is which controls the I2C bus now obviously they go off and do their thing and the rest of this is literally how we interact with those libraries so there's not much in the way of code here and at this point we can actually set the frequency I can literally write in at the moment I want 14 megs um, so 14 megahertz so I have to put it in Hertz and then add one extra zero not entirely sure why um, if I could get the get this library in you know a, a header file I could uh, interrogate it and figure out why that's happening, but we do, we just say an SI, you know, within we're calling a function here. So, and these are the internal parameters. So with the frequency, there's a statement there saying PLL fixed, and then we're saying that clock zero is the one we want to uh, operate. Uh, so you know this, as you know, this is capable of you know producing three clock frequencies but at the moment I've got it stripped right down this is the actual bare minimum and there's another setting here which is drive strength and you can literally just change this from 2MA to 4 to 6 to 8 now 2MA simply equates to about 0 dBm output and 8 I, mean, I think it's I think it's about 10 10 dBm I think but um, yeah there thereabouts and then obviously we've got a this is the void loop this is just a loop that continually runs with this is what happens with arduinos microcontrollers and what it's doing every time it goes through it you know calls this function update status which i imagine just means it writes um the various information across the i2c bus to the device and at the bottom here I've just got a one second delay yeah because it's in milliseconds and um, yeah we don't use delays when we program in C++ but it's there just for doing this type of you know, it's great for this kind of stuff when you're doing development work but that's it that's the bare bones so whatever frequency we set in here that's what's going to come out of clock zero and whatever level that we set here is going to be the amplitude of the waveform that comes out of clock zero that's it okay so let's upload this into the Arduino that's it we'll go and get it on the test gear and see if we can find 14 megs okay so we've uploaded our sketch um, this should be producing 14 megs and on the output here I've simply got this connected up to my oscilloscope Okay, well that's what's coming out of it, and if we look, it's saying that we're at 14.0017 megahertz. So we're a little bit off, but 
you know, we can deal with that. We, you know, we can calibrate this thing. Um, so, you know, in the program, we'll just put a correction in there, and that should pull this right. And if you look at the waveform, it's rather cruddy. I mean, it's producing a square wave. I mean, you could put that through a Schmidt trigger, and you'd get a perfect square wave. Um, let's just take a look at... Um, so if I see you notice how I've gone 20 megs that's it's got a 20 meg filter on it that's what I've put on there it's still not a very nice waveform and then if we go like this it's a square wave now what's happening is the reason it's a square wave because there's loads of other order products coming up there and obviously the scope isn't a spectrum analyzer it doesn't know what to make of them and that's what it looks like now if you were to put that into a mixer on a receiver you know all that it'll be mixing up all those other frequencies okay so if we look on the spectrum analyzer you know we've got a center frequency of 14 megs and as you can see she's coming up there um so there's a 14 meg signal there, but if we do a full span, so that I mean that goes up to two gigs, but you know we've got zero dBm here. That's a a fundamental frequency. But then we've got another one at minus 10. Mod, you know, and these are going to affect. We need to get rid of them. Okay, so what I've got here is a bandpass filter now this is this is why i chose 14 14 megs because this is for the 20 meter band but it will work on this it should work so now that's cleaned up you know that's really cleaned cleaned this up there are a few little uh, spurs and stuff but nothing like what we were getting obviously we we're still getting a fundamental frequency here you can't really see it so we go back to last span yeah so we're oh uh, yeah okay so we're a little bit below zero dbm i think we've got a bit of insertion loss in that bandpass filter because normally you get about uh, zero dbm so yeah there's a couple of db loss in that filter but that's cleaned it up and if we put it on to the oscilloscope that is much better that is uh yeah it's a nice sinusoidal uh it's a nice shaped waveform and that's what we want so if we're going to put this on a radio we need to make sure that we've got some form of filtering uh preferably a bandpass filter to clean that LO, the local oscillator frequency up before it goes into the, the rest of the radio. Okay, so this is our 11 meter transceiver schematic. So what we need to do is figure out uh, where we insert this uh, signal and you know what form of bandpass filtering we're gonna need to clean up the uh, signal. So let's zoom in a sec. So the section we want to look at is this section here. Now this has got a separate board and this is like a synth board. This is what synthesizes the local oscillator frequency. And how this works is we've basically got uh, a phase locked loop that's the combination of this IC which I imagine is just a phase comparator and frequency divider um, and obviously a voltage controlled oscillator so that makes up a PLL I think that this is quite limited I don't know what the range is on these but I imagine it's only something like 500 kilohertz if that um, and you'll start going off the edge of uh, its tunable range now yeah exactly what frequency this is running at i have no idea i'm certainly not an expert uh with these pll's and 
to get round the limitation of the bandwidth they use band crystals so we've got some here and what they sort of do so i think it says high mid and low um so it'll switch uh, one of these crystals in and it all gets mixed up in this ic here uh so yeah as we know if we mix things together we get some and difference and you'll get a lot of older products um yeah so we would have to remove that and then it moves into this section here and looky what we've got here a bandpass filter and uh, i don't know exactly what the range of this is I, I you know i don't know what the value of these things are but that is a two order bandpass filter and what we can do with our signal uh, coming from our clock generator i reckon we can actually feed this point here this will filter out all the nasties and this here is uh, where it goes into the rest of the radio so this that's our first hello at that point and it goes to two places obviously one section which i believe is here this this is for the transmitter so it gets mixed mixed up again to get the final um transmission rf product and then it will come down let's have a look uh, where are we yeah okay and yeah, it's here so it comes down here so this is the mixer and this is the first hello simples okay well let's get this i think what i may do is just remove this ic from uh from the radio completely but what i'll do before we do that i'm going to do a signal to noise test because i want to see how well this thing is performing now we have a thing called you know you get phase noise um which yeah you'll get that from phase lock loop systems um i'm not really equipped to make any you know measurements on that but one thing i can do is a signal to noise and um you know it's all to do with how well the local oscillators are performing among other things but it will all add to it so hopefully if we do signal to noise and then we'll put the uh the clock generator on there and then see if there's any noticeable difference it's not very scientific but yeah well, that's where it'll work so that's the plan this is the radio we're going to be converting so what i'm doing is doing a sign ad test basically on this it's a bit difficult with the covers off um yeah but um i think it's going to work okay so we're currently injecting minus 115 dbm frequency of 27.205 that's channel 20 on the display uh, we single sideband and we send it in a one kilohertz tone and i've got a 40 percent modulation happening on that and then and obviously we've got the radio set to upper sideband we're getting a one kilohertz tone on the money so it was a bit off frequency if you adjust the clarify you'll hear it but I've got it set to where it should be. So we're going to look on the test set. We're getting about, around about just under 6 dB of cyanide. And that's for minus 115 dBm of signal. And that's a 1 kilohertz tone. So, yeah, we can use that as a reference. Okay, so what we're looking at now is the local oscillator. This is the first hello and this is as it comes off uh, the bandpass filters now you can see it has got a little bit of noise on the top i don't know whether that's me or you know, it's the radio it could because what i'm thinking it could just be bad probing but the frequency is right 37.9 we're on channel 20 which is 27.205 uh, so the lo should be you know that frequency plus the if and the if is 10.695 megs so that's on the money and the amplitude is around about 900 millivolts the scope probe is on times one 
I don't, I don't think it's really going to have much of a loading effect on it, if I'm honest. So, yeah. So, yeah, about 900 millivolts. So the reason I wanted to look at this uh, is that, obviously, we're going to put this clock generator in there. Um, we want to make sure that we're getting um, the same similar uh, amplitude because I imagine the radio is expecting to see that. So, okay, let's move swiftly along. Okay, so I've removed the IC, uh, that's the mixer IC, and we're now injecting uh, the signal directly from the clock generator into that bandpass filter, uh, where we said, and I'm also taking a reading now on the output of that filter. So if we have a look at the scope, okay, so this waveform is a lot cleaner than the original. Uh, if you seem to remember it, we had a lot of jitter on the top and the bottom. I wasn't sure whether that was my probing technique and it was picking up noise, but it appears to be fine using the clock generator. So in summary, I would say that the phase lock loop, the VCO system originally in this radio, you know, they're pretty crappy. So yeah, that has made a great improvement. Um, and you can see the frequency, it's 37.9 megs, um, which is correct. I've actually written a bit of code in there and I've done a calibration on the unit to bring it onto frequency. We'll look at that in a second. Okay, if we can have a look, also look at this on the spectrum analyzer. Remember, this is the output of the filter. Okay, we're doing a full span at the moment. Uh, you can see, I don't know if you can see that, that's a fundamental frequency there. And yeah, we've still got some tiny spurs down here, but yeah, it's pretty good. And if we look at, let's just put this back into analyzer. Yeah, last span. Yeah, there's a, what's the name? We seem to be getting a bit of a noise around the skirt, maybe, I'm not sure. But remember, this is we're, we're using a scope probe. You know, this is just for indication. I'm not making any measurements because you can't use a scope probe uh, for doing this. So that's probably to do with that. But it seems, you know, on full span, that's much cleaner. Okay, so the thing to do now, let's do another signal to noise test on it. So we're now doing another cyanide test on it. And as you can see, this is the connection point. I think it was pin six on the IC that I'd removed. And if you look there, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a there's a small um, capacitor. It's just an AC coupling capacitor. It's just a thousand microfarads. Because uh, I just wanted to make sure it was, you know, there's no DC compass. Cause I've, I've got a feeling there might be a bit of DC on there. Uh, but yeah, that seems to be going good. So we're doing the cyanide test. Spectrum, we're giving it minus 110 dBm as we did before. And if we look, and we're getting about 8.7, yeah, between eight, oh, there it is, nine, nine dB for the same signal. Yeah, dB is a cyanide. So that's made an improvement, you know, and Okay, so I had a bit of a play with this. Um, it, it's, the receive range is improved as you know, opposed to what was on the bands. So it can now receive up to about 28 and a half megs and it will receive down to about 26 megs thereabouts. Um, and I think all that is is just that there's, you know, it's filters being tuned. So if you wanted to turn this into a 10 metre rig, it would be quite easy just to retune it. Um, but, you know, where it drops out, it's no fault of the local oscillator because that's constant. That's not giving us any problems whatsoever. Uh, there are a few drawbacks to this. The problem we have is we can't transmit, well, we can't, we can't modulate FM. That's the problem. We can't modulate it. Now, which is, um, yeah, a bit of an issue. Um, but there is another IC. Um, it's the SI5351B. Now, I've actually got some of those. And I'm just making a break out, you know, because there's a slightly different chip. 
Um, so I've got a, something there to make a breakout board with. And what I'm going to do is take the audio signal and f set this up as it was before, then feed that into to here and see if we can modulate FM. Now I'll do this in a future video, but um, you know, overall, as a you know summary, this has um, yeah, it's improved the radio. Now there's a good chance this radio is out of tune. I'd say it is. I've never touched it. I mean, it is how it is. Um, Somebody might have been in here with a golden screwdriver. You know, the thing's 40 years old. So, yeah, it could be slightly out of tune. But I've done the test like for like. I've not uh, I've not changed anything. And, you know, you, we could see the improvement on the oscilloscope. You know, with the waveforms, uh, they were much better uh, with this clock generator. And, um, yeah. So th there's a bit more. I mean, if you want me to make some more videos going through coding, I can. I don't know... I didn't want to put too much in the way of coding in here because it makes some people's ears fall off. But um, it would be quite easy to modify these radios with one of these. But simply using something, you know, an Arduino, you'd probably just get away with a uh, an Arduino Nano because, the, the you know, the Arduino is doing very little work. All it's doing is just sending information up the I2C bus. It's not doing hardly any number crunching. Um so yeah you could take the binary outputs of this and feed it directly into the nano and then just write a program for your channels and you could just do the same for the bands you know because you can dump all the band crystals and all that stuff and you could just literally feed it into the nano and just set your your bands and if you wanted to put you know weird and wonderful frequencies on i think it's like the um the uk fm it'd be very very easy to do you know so um okay well if you if you enjoyed the video and you want me to do some more on this kind of theme yeah leave it in the comments and i will make some more videos you know you know get into the programming possibly uh, i know programming isn't everybody's cup of tea but you know i don't mind doing it so okay well we'll catch you in the next video thanks for watching